Hey, Tim. Okay, let's see if I got this on here. Can y'all hear me okay? Can you hear me okay, you guys? We can hear you just fine, yep. Okay, and how about the screen? How's that screen look? Screen looks, looks great. Okay. All righty. All right, so good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for taking the time out of your evening to uh, come here and listen to me speak on the importance of gut health and how it correlates to our mental well-being. Uh, of course, amongst other ailments, and there are numer numbers of them. Um, I'll quickly introduce myself. So my name is Casey May, and first and foremost, I am a very proud mama of four wonderful babes. They range from 18, 13, 10, and 2, so it's a pretty broad range. Um, I'm also a proud military wife, and I'm very proud of my husband's service. So um, Currently, I am achieving my Master's of Science in Integrative Health. And I've already gotten my bachelor's in complementary and alternative medicine, while I also have education and training in the areas of holistic spa management, iridology, wellness consulting, nutritional counseling, essential oils, herbal medicine, and my personal favorite, energetic healing. Uh, so my journey actually started when I was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes at 24 years old in August of 2010. And I actually started out being a skincare specialist because I wanted it to be in someone's happy place. Um, so that was doing facials. But unfortunately, when my husband got orders to Italy, uh, I wasn't actually able to practice. And I was so, I was at that point, I was so fresh out of school that I didn't have any of my own equipment and we couldn't do anything uh, business wise. Uh, everything there was by donation only. And at that point, I had three kids and Josh, my husband, was literally gone all the time. I mean, he was in so many different European countries. I mean, you just couldn't keep track. Uh, so I found ACHS, which is American College of Healthcare Sciences, dove right in. And when I tell you that my eyes were wide open, I truly mean that. I mean, it was I was truly blown away with what I felt I internally knew yet I was never taught. And I started learning about then about what seemed so foreign to me at the time. Uh, so upon returning to the US, I was actually in more of a culture shock coming back home than when I first started my journey to Europe. It took at least, at least six months to adjust back to the food here. Uh, even the, you know, quote unquote, healthy choices, organic, you know, all that stuff. And now even over there in Europe, Fanta tasted better. Like it tasted like orange soda um, and the fast food was better. But even though we didn't do much of the fast food, um, a lot of it was because fast food places, does, they just don't exist like they do here. Like the numbers here are just astronomical compared to anywhere else I'd ever seen over there in Europe. Um, but a lot of the many don't realize that there are hundreds of substances and chemicals that are allowed over here in our food supply that is banned in European countries. Um, cesareans, C-sections are done in much larger numbers over here than anywhere else in the world. And that is where the microbiome starts. It's when we are born. So when we go through the, the canal of the woman, you know, we are showered pretty much with all kinds of bacteria and that really jumpstart our immune system. And the bacteria that's in our gut is really like a fingerprint. Um, it's really unique to everyone. And as you can see in these two pictures, uh, for me, they are great representations in the difference between what we call food here versus what food is found in Europe. Now, in many Chinese provinces, doctors do not receive payment if the patients get sick. So they get paid for keeping their patients healthy, which is actually quite the contrary to our system, which in my opinion is, I call it sick care. Uh, it's disease management. So how that's done over there 
that should be more of how we view our healthcare system and how we should abide by it. Um, and that is, you know, that's what I study. That's what I do. I'm more for preventative care, um, holistic. So caring for the whole person in their entirety, including what can't be seen. So one of the foundational pillars of this is gut health. One of the goals is to teach and guide others into finding that power along with them so that they realize that, you know, you learn about how to take care of your gut and by taking the power of, you know, how you respond to the, uh, the environment around you. So let's get started. <laughs> so now what is the microbiome? So the term microbiome refers to microorganisms that reside inside of the intestine. So each person actually has at least 200 different species of bacteria, viruses, and yes, fungi in their digestive tract. But we are talking actually like an estimated 100 trillion microbes that are found inside of the human body. And it's just that many of them reside in the gut, but it's literally found throughout the entire body. And many don't realize that we actually have outside of our body about five pounds of bacteria just floating around us and we don't even see that. Um, so, and even though, uh, so more often than not, parasites are even found bur burrowed inside of those intestines, which also adds to the chaos. Uh, another growing issue that I've become to see a lot more of is also candida albicans, which is a yeast overgrowth. Now these microscopic squatters have a tremendous influence on our day-to-day well-being and are in fact intricately connected to our long-term health because they've evolved to manipulate our thoughts and behaviors in order to ensure their own survival. Now, while there are many organisms that are harmful to our health, there are actually many incredibly beneficial and even necessary ones for a healthy body. In your intestinal tract, which is your largest immune system organ, <clears throat> with about 80% of your immune producing cells. And now we've all had a gut feeling. Yeah, well, and while that is a very popular saying based on our intuition and our instinct, our gut truly does play a role in our health and how we feel and how we function. And, uh, you know, gut health over the last couple of years has become quite a uh, trendy topic. And our gut microbiome actually describes the microbes and their genetic material that is found inside of the gastrointestinal tract. And we know now that the bacteria in our gut actually affects everything from our digestion all the way to our mental health. And you may think that your gut microbiome is in your stomach, but it's actually located in your large and small intestines. Now, as you ingest food, the gastric acid found in your stomach actually destroys a lot of those pathogens that you consume. But as we are consuming these microbes through our food and water, some of them do escape. Those, but the ones that do escape down the, uh, into the gastric acid they then move down into your intestinal tract. And the goal is to have a healthy microbiome. So factors like your diet, infections, and certain medications can have a major effect in its balance. So having an unhealthy gut microbiome can actually lead to certain diseases and affects your mental health. Now there is this, uh, this like crosstalk, what it's called as a bi-directional communicational uh, uh, pathway. So there's this talk between your gut and your microbiome in your body. So your gut microbiome plays a role in digestion, metabolism, and inflammation. And as I mentioned earlier, as an infant, your gut microbiome helps develop your gut immune system. And then as an adult, it helps to maintain it. So there are actually certain gut microbes that can produce small molecules, and those actually help to synthesize certain vitamins, uh, the enzymes, and even hormones that are needed in our body. So a higher level of diversity. So the more 
it not necessarily of how much we have, but how much of a variety that we have of all these different bacterial strains. So those having a good diversity in the gut is actually associated with improved health. So I know while research is ongoing, as always, you know, science is always evolving. There's already really pretty clear evidence that your gut health plays a role in many areas of your health and well-being. So it contributes to overall health and immune function. And of course, by making appropriate lifestyle and dietary changes, you know, everyone can help to alter and diversify the number of microbes in the gut. So uh, this can include probiotics, following a fiber-rich diet, and of course, um, avoiding the unnecessary use of antibiotics and disinfectants. And a lot of people actually don't know this, uh, but after taking an antibiotic, uh, which destroys both the good and bacteria, which that's something that people do know, but what they don't realize is that it can take up to one to two years to repopulate and heal the gut just from one round of antibiotics. So you can imagine, especially the children who are taking round after round of antibiotics for their ear infections or they go in because they're, they're just sick, they're not feeling good. Well, here you go, antibiotic. It's actually destroying their gut and it's actually setting them up for disease and illness later on down the line. Um, so, and of course, other simple lifestyle changes a person can make, including getting enough sleep, exercising regularly. Um, but what we don't realize is that the thing about holistic health, we do realize that literally every single aspect is related one way or another. So, you know, many parts of our modern life, you know, environment that can really affect the microbiome is, for one, high stress levels. <laughs> Pun intended, I can't stress that enough. Uh, high stress levels mess with everything in your body from your hormones to uh, how you eat. It is your stress has been what the CDC says is the number two uh, causing cause of death. Um, so between that, getting too little sleep, and then you have a Western diet that is high in processed sugars, uh, high processed foods. We have a McDonald's, you know, every square mile, it seems like, you know, there's every town you go through, there's going to be at least a couple of fast food spots. Um, and then you go, of course, and like, like I said, taking antibiotics. Um, what all this does is it messes with your immune function, hormone levels, um, your weight, and, you know, in turn, it involves into development of diseases. Now, no matter what religion you practice, doesn't matter what color you are, your creed, experience that you may have, a trauma that you may have endured, we are our own healers. We are our first physician. And a problem that we are seeing is a lack of accountability, but also a lack of, of belief, of faith. Um, and quantum science has begun to unravel just how intricate our being is, and that we are all energetic beings, magnetic beings, that we are shaped by our thoughts, where our beliefs are made manifest through our physical bodies. Many don't realize that our unresolved trauma gets stuck in our aura or in science, it's referred to as the biofield. And then it gets driven deeper and deeper into the physical body, where we finally begin to see it manifest into illness and disease. And your gut almost acts as if, you know, a second brain, because it releases so many neurotransmitters that affect our mental function. And a good 90% of our serotonin and dopamine are produced in the gut. So if your gut is unable to produce these natural mood stabilizers properly, then you are going to be at serious risk for disorders like depression and anxiety. Um, the gut prevalence of gut problems is a direct result of our modern lifestyle. The toxic and inflammatory foods we eat, the med medications that we take, infections that we come across, and chemicals that our bodies are exposed to. 
and the chronic stress and that many of us are under every day are the cause of these symptoms. Now, don't get me wrong. Stress can be good. It is the body's natural response against threats and it prompts your body to react to dangers quickly. It can also help keep you going. So think of the terms heart pumping and adrenaline high, you know, like runner's high. Uh, it's what helps you deal with pressures from work and life. However, we can become inundated with that stress and it can get to a point where it just doesn't turn off. Now, there are symptoms of stomach disturbances that can all be signs of an unhealthy gut. And that is why it is so important to learn to listen to your body. Symptoms are your body's warning system. Okay. Now I know that these are embarrassing, but you know, a lot of the common issues that we deal with are gas and flatulence, uh, bloating, constipation, which is so uncomfortable, diarrhea, uh, heartburn, and people don't even associate heartburn with bad gut health. But if you are not even chewing your food and you are pretty much depleting your gastric juices and then your body has to break it down and work even harder, you know, you, you're going to essentially end up with heartburn. Um, so this is actually where a food journal comes in handy. So recording what you eat, when and how much, that can actually be absolutely crucial to lasting change, like actual true change. So by taking accountability to the food that you ingest, but while also being able to start seeing a pattern and how you feel after you eat certain foods. Because it's one thing you can try to recall what you've eaten the day before or even previously that day, but there's always, there's usually going to be something that is missing from that component. Um, and by being able to put it down on paper, being able to actually see it visually, it, may, it clicks something into your mind and it helps you to really relay what you are doing. And it helps with the, the self accountability without really truly being feeling awful. I, I did that and I thought that I would, but it didn't make me feel bad. It actually helped to make me feel more empowered by doing that. So a balanced gut will actually have less difficulty processing that food and eliminating waste, which will likely lead to fewer symptoms. And it all starts when we smell the food. So when we smell the food, our gastric juices start, our enzymes start prepping, you know, getting prepared, you start to salivate. And then once you eat your food, you're supposed to thoroughly chew it, which is, you know, absolutely crucial. And they say the, the winning numbers are between 32 to 34 chews per bite. To truly chew your food thoroughly which makes it that much easier to be able to digest and break it down once it gets to your stomach and needs to start moving through the digestive system. Because if you are just inhaling your food and it's going through your esophagus down to the stomach acid, it's got to break down the food before it can even start digesting it. So if you've already broken down the food with your teeth like they're intended to do with the saliva, then you're going to move the food more efficiently and you're actually your body will be able to utilize and absorb the vitamins and minerals as it should. So there are many culprits that do hinder this. Um, so having a high diet sugar or high sugar diet, apologies, a uh, diet high in processed foods and added sugars can actually help to decrease, decrease the number of good bacteria and the diversity in the gut. So research is actually suggesting that this may lead to, you know, increased inflammation through the body. Of course, we know that sugar is inflammatory, but uh, inflammation can be the precursor to several diseases, including cancer. Um, another one is unintentional weight changes. So gaining or losing weight without changing your diet or exercise habits. That's also a sign of an unhealthy gut. Uh, with, before I found out that I had diabetes, I had had a major weight loss 
and I looked so unhealthy. It wasn't a, it was not a healthy weight loss. So, you know, that was a big red flag right there. So, um, if you ever see that with anybody quickly weight loss or weight gain, something's up. Um, an imbalanced gut can actually impair your body's ability to absorb nutrients, to help regulate the blood sugar and to store fat. Uh, weight loss can be a caused by malabsorption because of the small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, which an uh, acronym is SIBO. So if you ever heard hear that SIBO, it's a small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. So think of what I mentioned earlier with Candida albicans, which is a yeast. So, but on the other hand, weight gain may be caused by insulin resistance or increased inflammation. So it is very important for you to learn to understand and read your body. Listen to what it is telling you. The brain gut connection is evident when we experience butterflies in our stomach, typically when we're excited and love or scared. These strong emotions can cause people to experience GI symptoms. Science is beginning to understand the process behind this link, which ultimately relates to hormones released from different parts of our brain. Yes, they are in our head as well as other places in our body. Obviously, you know, we would circulate throughout the entire body to make it work. But when we are particularly stressed or excited, those can run rampant. So chemicals circulating in the bloodstream, that affects the sensitivity and the functions of the nerves in the wall of the gut, which can be collectively referred to as the enteric nervous system. Now, I know you guys have heard of this one. We actually, I've heard of this one quite a lot in the last couple of years. And there's this condition, it's called the leaky gut syndrome. And that can set you on the path to chronic illness. So symptoms go far beyond digestive issues. And thanks to our modern environment, as I've been talking about, these symptoms are much more common than you would think. In fact, millions of people are struggling with leaky gut syndrome without even knowing it. So, you know, pretty much think of your gut as like a drawbridge, okay? Your gut is naturally semi-permeable to let these teeny tiny little boats, which we'll refer to teeny tiny boats, but they're micronutrients, okay? They pass through your intestinal wall and into your bloodstream. It's how you absorb your food. So, of course, certain external factors, including food, infections, toxins, and stress, they can break apart the tight junctions in your intestinal wall, leaving that draw bid, drawbridge wide open. So now, once this happens, you have a leaky gut. So when your gut is leaky, much larger boats that were never meant to get through, so like toxins and microbes and undigested food particles can actually escape into your bloodstream where they are not meant to be at all. So your immune system marks these as foreign invaders and as pathogens, and they start attacking them. So uh, leaky gut syndrome has actually been linked to hormonal imbalances, joint pain, autoimmune diseases, such as rheumatoid arthritis, Hashimoto's, thyroiditis, diabetes, fibromyalgia, anxiety and depression, eczema, and rosacea. And that's just to name a few. Okay, so one thing to remember that the blood that is pumped through your digestive system and your bowels is recycled through your brain. So if you have dirty blood, quote unquote, dirty blood, think about what that is doing to your brain. All that recycling right on through just, you know, food for thought. <laughs> uh, so gut health is vital for immune function. So a 2019 review that was published in a food service research international, uh, it said that the gut wall acts as a barrier to viruses, fungi, and harmful bacteria. But unfortunately, this barrier sometimes, you know, like I said, becomes permeable. So instead of being semi-permeable, it becomes permeable and is known colloquially as leaky gut. So it's allowing these nasties to enter the bloodstream and make you sick. And there's no one factor that contributes to leaky gut. It's rather a combination of factors. 
So like I've been mentioning, diet, inflammation, antibiotic use, stress, all of that comes together to impact the integrity of the gut barrier. So that is one thing to remember. It's just like with pretty much anything and everything, it is going to be a conglomerate of issues. Now, a 2014 review, which was published in the Journal of Medicinal Food, it also suggests that gut health has a knock-on impact on mental health. So this communication between the gut and the brain is known as the gut-brain axis. And then this gut bacteria actually has the power to stimulate the nervous system. So sending messages to your brain through the vagus nerve. Plus microorganisms in the gut release neurotransmitters transmitters like serotonin, which can affect your mood. There have been numerous studies since, and they keep growing. So, and these are not limited to just a few diseases. These seem to span through every facet of being. And this is just a, something I just want to add in there. Now, there are three principal, principal pathways to the health and well-being of our bodies. And it's something that not very many people think of or take notice, but that we are electrical beings. You know, we are energetic. So even in science, that is, that is noticed, that is take notice, you know, the electrical stimulation of the vagus nerve. So think of when we gag while we're brushing our tongue, that is stimulating the vagus nerve. Um, another was production of the neurotransmitters. So such as your serotonin, melatonin, dopamine, and GABA. And then your modulation of the, the immune response. So body keeping itself in homeostasis. Now this, I love talking about the vagus nerve. Um, I actually did one of my literature reviews on Mediterranean diet and the gut. And of course that was when I really took a deeper dive into the vagus nerve. So now the vagus nerve is actually known as the wandering nerve. And it is the longest nerve, the longest cranial nerve, uh, cranial nerve number 10 of the autonomic nervous system. And this actually controls involuntary body functions. It carries sensory and motor fibers that connect the brain to the heart, the lungs, the digestive tract. Uh, it also regulates critical bodily functions such as your heart rate, blood pressure, breathing, and digestion, like all those unconscious acts. So it is the main nerve of the parasympathetic nervous system. Now the autonomic nervous system is made up of the parasympathetic nervous system, which controls the rest and digest functions. And the sympathetic nervous system handles the fight or flight responses. So the two parts are often thought of as being opposites of each other when in fact they are not. You can look throughout the whole body Nothing is ever actually opposite of each other. They just work in symmetry, in one way, shape, or form. So the vagus nerve transports nerve signals to the brain. And this helps to regulate involuntary functions, you know, like your heart rate, respiration, your blood pressure, and the peristalsis of, you know, so peristalsis is the wave-like contractions of the muscles that move through food through the digestive tract. So visually think of, okay, um, your, the muscles in your intestines, they, it's almost as if they are little waves of muscle contractions that are like massaging the food through. It's pretty much is what you, it like massages the food through. It's, I've seen a, a representation of it. It was actually pretty magical. Um, but yeah, so the vagus nerve actually also provides sensory information to the skin and the muscles, which in turn stimulates, you know, reflex actions like coughing, sneezing, swallowing, gagging, and vomiting. So the sensory information also stimulates bodily functions such as your sweating, your salivating, mucus production, and the urge to urinate. 
So the vagus nerve also forms a link between the gut and the brain. The vagus nerve is the communicational pathway, and it is known as the brain-gut axis. In recent years now, the scientists have established a link between the dysfunction of the brain-gut axis and in conditions like obesity, epilepsy, and depression. So when the communication system between the microbiome and the brain is malfunctioning, you will experience physical as well as mental conditions. Now, certain species of bacteria can help produce chemicals in the brain called neurotransmitters. So for example, serotonin is an antidepressant neurotransmitter. That's mostly made in the gut. As mentioned earlier, about 90% of it is made in the gut. So serotonin impacts every part of you from your emotions to your body and your motor skills. It helps with sleeping, healing, and digesting. So serotonin is also thought to be a mood stabilizer and helps your body to regulate anxiety, experience happiness, heal wounds, and stimulates uh, nausea. Now, GABA is an inhibitory neurotransmitter. GABA blocks or inhibits certain nerve transmissions. So it decreases the stimulation of neurons. And this actually means that a neuron that receives a message along the way, but doesn't act on it. Um, so the message actually isn't sent onto the other neurons. This is actually a slowdown. And this slowdown in message transition may actually be helpful because it helps to modulate mood and anxiety. So, okay. In other words, <laughs> GABA calms your nervous system down. It helps you to not become overly anxious or afraid. Um, and then as a hormone and a type of neurotransmitter, dopamine is released into your bloodstream. It plays a, a small role in the fight or flight syndrome. Um, and the fight or flight response actually refers to your body's response to perceived or real stressful situations. So like I said, perceived or real, whether you see it in your mind or it's actually happening in your environment. If you can see it in your mind, it is real and your body will react the same to both. Um, so, you know, that's just something to think of because uh, that was something, I think it was in the 90s, there was a few studies that were done on athletes, on runners. Those that were sent to, you know, uh, visualize it, dream about it, and others that actually did the acts of training and all that. And they took those that, they took both and they pretty much one had, they all had the same thought pattern of like training, you need to do this, but except one visualized, one actually acted on, and they both had the same results. So isn't that something? I love that. I just love that story. Uh, so anyway, so now... Right here, uh, I only have three strains that are mentioned here, but uh, in later slides, I will show you actually 15 strains, but studies are actually starting to reveal what certain strains are capable of and how they contribute to our health, um, how they help to shape behaviors and thought patterns, and more than what we are led to believe. So while we are made to think outside of ourselves, we should look at the own community that actually resides within us. So now universities all over the world have actually taken interest in the gut-brain connection. Um, and we realize that bacteria are a good thing for us. However, knowing what strains do what is a pivotal and paramount field of study that truly can help heal and change the outcome for many individuals. <clears throat> now the microbiota, microbiome, can produce metabolites, which are actually substances that are broken down and then used by the body. And then these are to be used for energy, for maintaining health, um, removing toxins even. Now, these metabolites actually play an important role in the development and the function of the immune system. And due to the body's reliance on the microbiota for these vital substances, 
a person's health may actually be influenced by the health of their microbiota. So while microbial communities can be found all over the body, over 80% of human resident microorganisms are contained in the GI tract. So we can start to figure out what we can do. What changes can we make that are, for one, foundational changes? And how we can respond to daily life. How conscious are we of our thoughts? Are we aware of how we eat? When do we eat? What do we allow into our space? And what can we do about it? Now, I mentioned some of this already, but here is a little breakdown, I guess a recap, if you will, of what wreaks havoc on our microbiome. It is usually never what just one issue, but usually a conglomerate and a layering of these consequences together that manifest in disease into disease and illness that to many actually seem to come out of nowhere, but typically they don't. Um, and that's just not true because our body is trying to tell us for usually quite a long time. You know, they're trying to tell us what is wrong for a while before we typically get, you know, slapped in the face and finally take notice. So, um, so some of the quote unquote diets that I recommend and I follow myself. Now I don't, it's, I don't follow just one. I actually take something from each of these, but these are the four that I have studied the most that I use the most and that I will always suggest the most. Um, so the Mediterranean diet, absolutely number one, hands down. Then there's the anti-inflammatory diet, the Whole30, and the Paleo. Uh, these are more lifestyle diets. You know, these are not fads. That's why these actually are, they actually have scientific studies to back them up. There is historical um, meaning to these lifestyles. So they do have research that can support this as well. Now, diversity, as I've said before, is key and without fail. Food falling under these four categories will help you to keep a uh, healthy microbiome and to stay in good health. Now, certain bacteria digest fiber and produce short-chain fatty acids, which are important for gut health. Fiber may help prevent weight gain, diabetes, heart disease, caloric cancer, um, and of course, risk of many other cancers as well. And then of course, too, there's garlic. Now, according to a 2019 study in mice, garlic may actually increase gut microbe diversity and improve gut health. So it, garlic is much more than just, you know, antibacterial and good for your heart. It actually can help produce a better gut. So another study, a smaller study done in 2018 on 49 people similarly found that aged garlic extract increased diversity and levels of beneficial bacteria. So again, there's more than one study that is showing over and over they're producing the same results. So, so now, of course, there, as always, still more research in humans should be done. But number three fermented foods. These are great dietary, dietary sources of probiotics. Uh, you can have them of kimchi, sauerkraut, yogurt, kefir. Uh, and when it comes to kimchi, I've actually seen so many various kinds of kimchi. I just seen a girl do one with watermelon the other day. Uh, you can pickles, you know, anything fermented, sourdough bread, by introducing and maybe just taking a bite out of these different fermented foods a day, you would just in a couple of weeks, you'd be able to start seeing a major difference in your health. Um, so that, you know, fermented foods, in my opinion, are one of the top tiering foods that we need to focus on when it comes to improving your gut health. And research suggests that consuming these foods may improve the gut microbiome. So the fourth one is collagen boosting foods. And these come in the form of like bone broth and salmon skin. And of course, these are beneficial for both overall health and gut health. 
So a 2021 study actually indicated that supplements with collagen may benefit the gut microbiome in mice, which of course further study is needed, but you'd also try boosting your body's collagen production through your diet. So to help your body make collagen, try eating more citrus fruits, broccoli, meat, eggs, and a variety of nuts. Um, now diet signals are crucial. I've done a lot of research over the last few years. And let me just say that death is inevitable to the deficiency of minerals, okay? Many diseases have been corrected due to a correcting a deficiency with a vitamin or mineral. So think of rickets, that was vitamin C. Uh, measles, vitamin A. You know, so these are known to be prevalent deficiencies of what I have over here. And especially here in a supposedly first world country, uh, like magnesium, magnesium is actually supposed to be one of the easiest ones to obtain, but yet we, there's usually three out of every four people who are deficient. So making sure to get these are crucial to longevity and quality of life. Okay, probiotics, no, they are not all equal. Number one, I do have to say, if you have to put it in the fridge, no bueno, okay? Um, so aside from the vitamins and minerals, these are actually some of the very important components to the web of what we call our body. Now the network within us needs these amino acids, flavonoids, polyphenols, and antioxidants to work with the bacteria, sorry, bacterial strains and neurotransmitters that can control and speak to the various elements of our physical and our mental health. These right here are individual foods that can contribute to the diversity and the health of the microbiome. Now I can put this into a PDF if anybody is interested um, so that you, know, you can have this list to kind of help to refer back to. Um, this is actually kind of copied off of one of the lists that I have hanging around my house. So it is very, very beneficial because I also my kids because I'm like, see, see, there you go. <laughs> um, now, do not forget the prebiotics. Now, like I said, probiotics and all that seem to have been like the big fad, but um, don't forget about the, the prebiotics is they actually help to feed that friendly bacteria. So this is actually a smaller list, but this is a list of foods that can help feed the bodies, the body fiber, while helping to feed the good and the friendly bacteria inside of our guts. Okay, I'm gonna say chicory root and jacama root from what I have seen are absolutely divine when it comes to the prebiotics. Now I have put together a, a small list. Now these lists are not the catch-all. They are not everything, but they are a good start. They are a good list to get a good idea of, you know, good foods to look for. And a list of herb medicines that also contribute to a healthy bowel system are these. So these can, of course, these can be made into tinctures, uh, capsules, they can be drank in teas. Most of the time they can just be put into salads. So like your dandelion, um, marshmallow root, you can actually make marshmallows. Ginger, of course, ginger goes with almost anything. And the two that I would say are probably the absolute best are Atlas, aloe vera and slippery elm. Those are great for calming any inflammation. They are great for coating and soothing the lining of the bowel system to help the inflammation, to help food be able to passage through a lot smoother, give you your body a lot less work. So this is a great list of herbal medicines and just herbs to take just daily. Um, so now these are the couple of slides that I put together that I'm not actually, I'm obviously I'm not going to read through all of that because these are the 15 probiotic strains that I've currently done research on that I know, um, have been studied and what they have been proven to be helpful in support of with our bodies. Um, so 
as I've said before, I can always put this into a PDF form so that you guys can have access to it. I'm pretty sure that Joe will be putting this on her YouTube channel so you can always refer back to that as well. So this is the other um, page is a little, you know, a dive deep into these different bacterial strains. So when you do find a probiotic, do not go with if it just has one or two or three, you want to get a probiotic that actually has a bunch. Um, I know they uh, you hear that saying like more is not better. In this case, it is. Because as I've been saying through this presentation, diversity is your best friend when it comes to these. So the more that you are able to get into your diet or ingest, the better off your whole entire health and well-being is going to be. Now, I do have a coaching system that I have been putting together. Uh, it's going to be focusing more on lifestyle, health, and wellness, um, pretty much taking accountability, asking you the hard questions. I'm looking, taking a look at, you know, what are you seeking in your life? I'm more like a, a coach, a cheerleader, if you will. Um, now, I do practice into the emotion code. I'm working on becoming a practice, practitioner, as Joe is, because I believe in the power of energy and energetic healing. Uh, I am also Reiki uh, certified in Reiki's one and two. I can do these on Zoom and in person. I'm also an uh, employee well-being coordinator. So if you know of a company that needs someone to come in and talk to the team and talk to individuals and kind of bring in a, a harmony, a camaraderie and structure, then I am your gal. And then I also, I do public speaking. I'm, you know, building my repertoire when it comes to that. So um, if you are interested, here is my email if you would like to reach out to me. And of course, it doesn't even have to be on this or my services. If you would just like to reach out, I am a great listener too. So um, I do want to thank everyone for coming. And I really do hope that you enjoyed it. I hope it wasn't too long winded. And um, yeah, so I hope everybody enjoyed. Thank you. Thank you, Casey. That was thank you. Fantastic. Whew. How long did I take? <laughs> <laughs> long enough to get this information out so that people can hear it. So I'm oh glad that you included your contact information. I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording.